Dear students, today we are going to talk about experiment number two. The title of the experiment is Electrons in Emission of Light. So this experiment is, consists of two, uh, two parts. The first one is electrons. We will talk about electrons, how electrons were being discovered. And then in the second part, we will talk about emission of light, how the light is being emitted by different compounds, especially the metals. So this is the first video. It is the PowerPoint slides in which we will talk about most of the time you know, we will talk about the theory part and then the demonstration part. Uh, it will be the next video, which has been already uh, uploaded by the staff, instructor staff. So you will watch the video how to perform the experiment. And then at the end, there will be uh, results and discussion part as well. So this part, which is theoretical part is consists of uh, three headings. The first is the objective of this experiment. The second part is theory. And then the last part will be apparatus. So objectives. The, there are five objectives of this experiment. The first objective is to understand the concept of electron discovery. It means how electrons were being discovered or which of the scientists uh, was responsible for the discovery of electron or which of the scientists they contributed uh, for the discovery of electrons. And then the second objective is to gain an understanding of the relationship between emission spectra of hydrogen and atomic structure. So we will talk about how different elements, different compounds, they emit different uh, color radiations, especially in flame test. So what is the relationship of the color to the elements? The third objective is to observe the color of light emitted by different elements. So this is the really the, the true experiment, which we call it a flame test. In the flame test, so we will burn some elements, uh, especially in the in flame, in, uh, uh, and then they will give us different colors. And these colors are very specific for such elements, for some elements. So these elements actually, so we can find from the color they give in a flame test. So the fourth one is to identify the metallic elements in unknown salt samples. So this is the same as the third objective. The last objective is to realize the different elements emit radiation with unique frequency. This is the specific specific or we can say that uh, each element in the compound or each element or uh, they emit different types of radiation not two elements they emit same types of radiation so this is a kind of qualitative test in which we can find uh, the elements from its flame color before going to the electron discovery actually we first we will talk about cathode rays uh, so cathode rays and electron discovery because the electron discovery actually it was coming from the cathode rays as well so cathode rays are the radiation emitted by the negative electrodes which is called cathode in a vacuum tube called cathode ray tube so first of all you can see even the picture as well we have two pictures the the top one and the bottom one both are same we have cathode rays tube, the glass tube, it is called cathode rays tube. So CRT, usually we call it CRT, cathode rays tube. In cathode rays tube, the, there are two electrodes, one on the left side, one on the right side. The left side is cathode, which is negatively charged electrode. The, the, the right side is, it is the positive electrode, we call it anode. Usually the radiation which are coming out of cathode, we call it cathode rays. That's why they are called cathodes because they were coming out or emitted out of the cathode side. So that's why they were called cathode radiation. So how can we generate cathode rays? We need a very high voltage, high power supply. Usually uh, in the lab, we have a power supply which can produce more than 10 kilovolt. So you have to have this much power or the voltage 10 kilovolt the cathode ray produce a beam of radiation which travel towards you know when we pr provide these kind of connect the the power supply with the anode and cathode and then when you switch it on we will see that 
some radiation they were coming out of the cathode and they will travel towards the anode when the cathodes hit the screen they produce fluorescent light you can see in the first diagram as well so there the blue light is there or the green sorry the green light is there so the green light is because of the when these radiations they hit the inner surface of the cathode ray tube so they will produce uh, a flash of different colors usually it is green or maybe sometime it is blue so when the cathode rays pass through the electric or magnetic field what will happen so look at this in this diagram you can see this is a very high voltage power source and then we have a, a cathode which is negative charge and then there's anode the red one which is positive charge so cathode radiation will be emitted from the negative which is cathode and then will go towards the positive which is anode but there is a small hole in the anode so these radiation will pass through it and then they will hit the photographic plate or the fluorescent screen which is a black one on this extreme right but before this if we put any electric or magnetic field so they will deviate now the question is to which side the cathode rays will deviate to the positive side or to the negative side the answer is definitely it will move or bend or deflect towards the positive uh, pole of the electric or magnetic field this gives a very nice clue for us because if something is going towards the positive we can deduce we can conclude that it has negative charge so that's what happened with the cathode rays first of all we have some clue because they were coming out of the cathode cathode so we thought they were negative charge now when we put in the electric field or magnetic field they deviate or deflect towards the positive so this is a kind of conclusion for us that cathode is a negatively charged uh, radiations now who was the scientist who laid the foundation of the cathode that was jj thompson jj thompson is credited with their discovery in 1897 later on these cathodes were named as electron why they were named electron because many scientists they worked on it so the mass to charge ratio of the cathodes were exactly equal to the mass to charge ratio of electron so later on they were called okay oh these cathodes which were discovered many years ago they were actually electrons so they have same mass to charge ratio same charge same mass so what are the properties of the cathode rays usually we ask the students in the lab to write few properties of the cathode rays usually sometimes they, they 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 write it very well sometimes usually they don't understand what are the properties of the cathode rays. so here in this slide we will discuss some properties of the cathode rays so first of all look at the first property cathode tra uh, rays travel in straight lines of course they travel in the straight line uh, because if there is no electric or magnetic field if there is electric field or magnetic field of course they will deviate from their straight line and they will go towards the positive so now the second properties they produce a shadow when obstructed by object if there is an opaque object it is not a glass not transparent the the cathode rays will be stopped and then you can see the shadow as we see the shadow in the sun radiation as well so the third is they they deflect towards positive electric magnetic field as uh, we already discussed in the earlier slides the fourth one is they have negative charges of course they have negative charges because we already we have this conclusion that they have negative charge because they deflect towards the positive pole of electric field or magnetic field the last one is they have some energy you look at the diagram here in this slide there is a pedal wheel when the cathode is headed the uh, uh, hit the pedal wheel they can the pedal wheel starts moving towards the opposite direction towards the other direction why because these cathode is a very high energy radiation so they can give energy to the pedal wheel which is a very frictionless uh, in a very low friction uh, wheel so if a small amount of energy is needed to move it so they have this energy enough to move the pedal wheel so these are certain properties of the cathode is we should know about it now we come to electromagnetic radiation electromagnetic radiation 
it is applied to all kind of radiation with it it is light radiation there are some other radiation they are called electromagnetic radiation so the most important thing about the electromagnetic radiation is the wavelength and frequency but here we will talk about the wavelength what is the wavelength to understand the electronic structure of atoms one must understand the nature of electromagnetic radiations the distance between corresponding points an adjacent wave is called wavelength we call you know it is denoted by lambda so if we have two waves the distance between the two adjacent waves are called this is called wavelength usually because we call a wave length it means in short or in simple words the length of a wave if it is a length the, the unit should be meters or nanometer or micrometer so the wavelength units are meters are we sometimes because they are so smaller we can measure them in nanometer as well this diagram you can see two uh, electromagnetic radiation of waves two types of waves so the first one and the second one the difference between the first one and the top one I mean the bottom one is the top one we have you know, the wavelength is very shorter for the bottom one the wavelength is a big a bit longer so what is the difference between the shorter wavelength and the longer wavelength so we have another thing with the uh, in electromagnetic radiation we have two things as i discussed in the in the in the previous slides there are two things which are important for the the way uh, the for the radiation first is the wavelength of course it is important and the second thing which is attached to it which is connected to it it is the frequency so now if you look at these two waves the the top one and the bottom one the top one has a very short wavelength and the bottom one you know the the second one it is a longer wavelength now we have a relationship we can relate uh, wavelength to the frequency so there's a relationship you can see at the bottom that frequency nu uh, is proportional to one divided by lambda usually we call it inverse relation inverse relation means if you increase if one is being increased the other should be decreased if you increase one the other will decrease it means if you have a longer wavelength the frequency will be shorter means smaller if you have a shorter wavelength the frequency will be you know bigger or you can say frequency will be more so what is frequency because we already talked about the wavelength the wavelength is the distance between two adjacent waves so what is a frequency frequency it is, it is defined as the number of waves passing through a single point in one second. The more, the, if the wavelength of the waves are shorter, they can, you know, pass through a certain point in very high quantity. I mean, you know, the number should be high. That's why the frequency will be high. So, all electromagnetic radiation travels at the same velocity. So all electromagnetic radiation, which is the light emitted from a sun, or light emitted from any any other source, so the travel, uh, the speed, the velocity is same. So what is the velocity of electromagnetic radiation? Usually we call it the speed of light in space. We call it c. C. This is some units like you can see in your screen: 3.00 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. It is the speed of light in space. Now, if you look at the relationship again, uh, frequency is proportional to or inversely proportional to lambda, which is a wavelength. Here we have a constant. Whenever we remove the proportionality sign, we need a constant. So you can see in the second, you know, the, the equation, V is equal to, or you can see nu is equal to C divided by lambda. C, this C is a constant, which is the speed of light. We can rearrange this equation down. C is equal to lambda nu we see the speed of light lambda is uh, the wavelength and nu is the frequency now if you look at the diagram on the right side it is actually it is the visible spectrum it is the spectrum or you can say this is a range of electromagnetic radiation electromagnetic radiations is we discussed earlier this is not you know it's not uh, restricted to only one radiation we have a range of radiation we have a variety of radiation we started from the very shorter wavelength the high frequency which is gamma radiation which is very uh, 
dangerous you can say they can penetrate the bodies they they, they can change even they mutate the bodies or the genes etc you go for the x-rays which are a little bit longer than gamma but still it's very short wavelength means high frequency and then you go for ultraviolet and then for visible the visible actually this is a very small range we can say it is from 400 nanometer and going across 500 600 700 and 750 nanometer sometime it is written 800 nanometer so this is the range of visible so this is the light we can see all other electromagnetic radiation we cannot see them whether it is radio frequency that's very commonly used in mobiles and technology so we use the radio frequency in our mobiles radio frequency uh, radiation uh, uh, are being used so we cannot see them microwave you cannot see them infrared this is a red radiations visible this is you know we can this call visible that's why it's called visible we can see them so what about the the downs if you look at the down we have colors so this color actually we, when you pass a visible light through a prism you will see this scheme color scheme we call it a spectrum spectrum is it, uh, it is the uh, it is different colors in one place so it starts from indigo or you can see violet indigo blue green yellow orange and red so if it is from until 400 it is the you know the initial uh, the, uh, the visible starts at this wavelength 400 nanometer and then it ends at 750 nanometer which is a red color this is very important because all the flame tests we will do on the same visible spectrum we will see different colors and then we will match it with the with the color here in this spectrum visible spectrum and then we will write the wavelength of it now there are two types of spectrum as we talked about in about the spectrum in the previous slide now in this continuous in line spectrum continuous spectrum usually it is the uh, the sunlight has a continuous spectrum means when you pass through a prism you will have a complete set of colors in one place so this is called continuous spectrum and then what is other called line spectrum what is line spectrum line spectrum means it is sometimes we call it atomic spectrum atomic spectrum means if we heat a substance especially atom so the electron will jump from lower to higher and then when they come back so they will emit radiation this radiation is very specific for each element so it will give you one line that's why we call it line spectrum if you look at the at the 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 last two two structures the black one the, the so you can see a yellow line here in the first one and then on the down one which is hydrogen we have four different lines the one is purple color one is blue color one is red color why the color comes like this the blue color because in the, it is in the blue region red it is in the red region yellow yellow it is in the yellow region so means this is characteristic property of each element they will give radiation in a specific wavelength now electronic excitation and emission of radiation how electrons are being excited and how we can get radiations so neil bohr's actually he was a scientist he was uh, so he explained about electrons and, and protons means the nucleus he says that electrons in an atom can only occupy certain orbits he said that electrons are not scattered inside the element before this it was jj thompson who said that electrons are scattered in the uh, in the atom but he says no electrons can only move in specific paths we call them orbits or we sometimes we call it shells or orbits so these are means specific paths specific paths for electrons if electron is moving in orbit number two it will move in orbit number two unless we disturb them how by giving some energy so the second postulate electrons is in permitted orbits have specific energy means if electron is moving in orbit number one orbit number two or orbit number three they will have specific energy so they will not absorb energy or emit energy if you look at the diagram here on the left side the top diagram 
so it is n1 n is equal to 1 n is equal to 2 3 4 5 6 these are the orbits actually n is equal to 1 means orbit number 1 n is equal to 2 means orbit number 2 n is equal to 3 orbit number 3 4 5 and 6 now if you look at the down diagram it's a very interesting diagram because look at this the yellow one excitation energy if you give excitation energy the blue one give it to the yellow one it will excite it will jump whenever you excite electron it will jump from lower to higher it means if it is in orbit number one it can jump to orbit number two or orbit number three or four or five six and any it depends upon the how much energy you give it to him but if you take back this energy the one you give it to him it will come back to its original position it means if any electron jumped from orbit number one to orbit number two whenever you remove the energy it will go back sometimes we call it drop back it will drop back to the, its original orbit so whenever it's dropping back to its original orbit they will release the energy and this energy is in the form of radiation this has been already discussed by energy is only absorbed or emitted in such a way as to move an electron from one allowed energy state to another the energy is defined by e is equal to h nu e is the energy h is the planck's constant and u is the frequency you can see here if you look at the top diagram you have different series series means if you look at lamin series lamin series means we have orbit number five four three two one if electrons jump electron can jump from orbit number five to one four to one three to one two to one so this is called Lyman series and then we have some other series as well so the energy of radiation emitted the energy absorbed or emitted from the process of electron promotion or demotion can be cal calculated by equation so we have equation if electron jumps from orbit number two jumps back from orbit number two to orbit number one how much energy will be released we can calculate this energy how by using delta e delta e is mean the changes in energy minus rh this rh is the Rydberg constant this is a constant value we can put it there and one divided by n what is n it is the number of orbit it is the orbit it may be one two three four five n f square minus one divided by n i square i square means the initial position of the electron it may be in two or three and then f is the final position suppose if an electron is coming big from orbit number three to orbit number two so the three will be i and i is equal to three and if it is coming to two it will be and f will be two so this will be we can find the energy by using this this relationship now the wave nature of matter lewis de Broglie, the famous scientist he showed that if light can have material properties because it was known before that light has both characteristic the wave property and particle properties but de Broglie actually uh, he explained that if light can have both nature like uh, light has the nature of particle and nature of wave so why not matter should have the nature of both so he actually discussed all these things in his theory so we call it de Broglie, Lewis, uh, de Broglie dual, uh, dual nature of light like this he proposed that frequency and wavelength can be associated with an electron energy and momentum lambda will be equal to h divided by mv is the momentum lambda is the lambda is we call de Broglie uh, wavelength is equal to h is the Planck's constant m is the momentum so this equation is very famous in the uh, atomic structure now we come to the flame test as i told you in the beginning of this uh, powerpoint uh, presentation that we should have we should discuss two experiments together one is the electron discovery of electron emission of radiation and the second part is flame test flame test have the same has the same basis of electronic excitation you burn something give energy electron jumps from lower to higher when they come back they will emit radiation in a specific uh, wavelength which gives us different color 
So it is used to detect the presence of metal ion based on the emission spectrum. So this is very specific. Suppose if we take the sodium salt, sodium chloride, and maybe some other salt. So we will have, when we do the flame test, we will get a yellow color. So we can say, oh, this is yellow color, a little bit orange color. This is because of the sodium. Because sodium electron, when it jumps, when it comes back to its original position, it gives you radiation in the yellow region. That's why we see yellow color. So these tests involve the introduction of sample into a non-luminous flame in the observation of resulting color. This test is easy and fast. You can do this test in one minute even because you just uh, put some salt sample into the flame, non-luminous flame, so it will give you a color. So you can know, you can directly know this is which compound is present in this uh, unknown uh, material. Now, we have the background here. When the atom of gas or vapor attain energy, the electrons are excited. As I uh, we discussed before, that when you heat something, especially a sample, so it gets energy. And this energy is being utilized to dislodge or remove an electron from its lower position. And then electron will jump from lower position to higher position. You can see here in this uh, diagram, the electron is in the orbit number one. When we give energy, it moves to orbit number two. This is called excited state, but it will not remain forever there. Immediately, it will come back to its original position, and then it will release energy in the form of radiation. Means when it give radiation, it will be a specific wavelength radiation. It means it will have a color. So this color is very useful to find the, the, the metal ions. This is very specific for different metals. Now we come to the apparatus. What are the apparatus we use in this experiment? Of course, we use cathode ray tube, different types to, to know about the cathode rays. And then we use Bunsen burner, platinum wire loop, beaker, test tube, wash glass, and lighter. All these, the rest of the things they are used in the flame test. Uh, Assalamu alaikum student. We have an uh, experiment here about the discovery of electron. And the apparatus here used for this experiment is composed of higher voltage source and uh, vacuumed tube containing two plates. Uh, this one this is plate and this is plate and also another plate there right now when an energy being applied on both sides it will generate energy or we call it radiation right so if you if you see here so you can see here in this side generate the radiation going toward this side so this is known as cathode and this one known as anode so therefore this radiation is given a name called cathode ray because it is actually generated at the cathode side properties of this uh, cathode ray it's actually invisible so if you look here you don't see any ray right but it is moving in a straight line so therefore when it is subjected to when it is when it is passing through a slit here it will show a straight line so this means this radiation moving in a straight line again we believe this ray is an object so if it is an object it will behave according to the properties of object so if this ray is being subjected to a magnet and you will see the effect of magnet on this radiation and you can see here so it will actually you see it here deflection it's happening so this means this ray is actually having a charge right so 
it moves straight line and it has a charge this is two properties important that we should know about it and also another property that the uh, the nature of the ray here regardless of the source remain the same this is uh, uh, the property there is another property we'll show you in another setup in this part of the video we're going to show you the properties of the cathode ray as it has kinetic energy previously we show you that the cathode ray is moving straight line it has a negative it has a charge and it is invisible and uh, in this part we'll show you that this ray has energy so if i turn on the energy here the voltage so you can see here it's actually uh, you know uh, is applied on this wheel and we are expecting the wheel to move right due to the kinetic energy that the, the cathode ray has so as you can see here so this is the cathode going this direction for forcing the wheel to go this direction now we're going to swap the electrode here you go. this is the cathode now causing the wheel to move to the right side we're going to swap again and you can see the wheel moving this side this means the cathode ray has actually energy as causing this wheel to move so according to according to this uh, you know uh, observations that as cathode ray has uh, has, a, has a mass and has uh, a charge as we have shown you it moves straight line is invisible and causing uh, this wheel to move it has kinetic energy so all of this we come to, co to the conclusion that by the british scientist in 1897 he concluded uh, and published a paper saying that uh, the this cathode ray is a stream of negatively charged particles called electrons. So this is a proof to you that electron is there. It is an object. It has a mass, and it has energy. Bismillah. Uh, my dear students, now we are going to perform the second part of the experiment, number two, which is flame test. The flame test is an approximate uh, identification of the metal ion provided to us here. And these metals, they will provide different colors at the flame and which can be used to identify the unknown sample. Let us proceed how to perform this experiment. In order to perform this experiment, first step, you have to light the Bunsen burner in a safe manner. Make sure that you have put on your uh, safety glass or you cover your face and keep the Bunsen burner away from your body and light up the lighter first and slowly open the gas tap okay now you can see the flame here is a luminous flame which is not suitable for our experiment by adjusting the hole which can increase the amount of oxygen at the bottom you try to make it blue as much as possible so we call it non-luminous flame okay the first step we have done safely and then we go on to the second step, this is the wire loop that we are used, going to perform the experiment by bringing the sample to the flame. 
we have to make sure this is clean. How? The cleaning procedure is very simple. Just go to the 1 m hydrochloric acid, dip your wire loop, so which will dissolve any impurity or anything into that, and then you can clean it with the water and try to bring it to the Bunsen burner. If you observe a color here, it means your wire loop is not clean. So what you do, you repeat this process two, three times to clean your wire loop. As you can see now, your wire loop is almost clean. Your wire loop is almost clean, it doesn't give any color. Okay, now what we do is, we go to the third step by immersing that uh, wire loop into water and let's go to our known chemical lithium. So this chemical has lithium metal ion. Let me dip my wire loop into this lithium chemical. So it will bring only very little amount of chemical, even a small crystal is enough. Then bring this sample close to the flame and you can observe it is producing and producing a unique color which is maybe close to the red or we can say it is a mixture of red and a little bit of pink color. So what you will do now? You have to record the color of this flame in the table provided and then you have to use this color chart to compare the color of this flame in this table. So what can you do? So you can see that blue color, green, yellow, uh, red something okay and our uh, the lithium is somewhere around our lithium is somewhere around uh, 700 nanometer it is somewhere around 700 nanometer okay now what you do you will go with your lab manual we have a table one here so our lithium sample we write the color of the flame maybe the red or red mixed with pink whatever you observe and then you write the wavelength. Approximated wavelength is approximate wavelength is 700 nanometer. Okay, fine. In this similar way, what we are going to do, we are going to perform the flame test for each of these elements, and we are going to record their flame color, and we are going to estimate their wavelength using the spectrum provided, and we will complete this first table. Okay, now we will move on to second sample, which is sodium. I will bring a new wire loop and clean it. Once it is clean, you just dip this wire loop into sodium sample and bring it close to the flame and observe. You can see a very nice golden yellow color flame, which is a unique flame provided by sodium, produced by sodium. And the wavelength of this, we can observe from the spectrum is around 590 nanometer, approximate value. Okay, now sodium is done. You will record it in your table. Now we will proceed with the next sample. Our next sample is calcium. So the calcium, again, we are not going to use the same wire loop. We'll be using a new wire loop for that. So make sure that it is clean. You can see it's producing a color. So we clean it with the acid and then the water. And you can see the wire loop is almost clean. Now you dip it in the water and immerse it in your sample, which is calcium chemical, and bring it to the fire. You can see it's producing an orange color which is close to the color of the sodium. Maybe this will confuse you because the sodium and the calcium, they are close to each other. You can see, but it seems a little bit dark orange. But in order to compare this color, what can we do is, we can take the sodium and the calcium together. Let's go for that process. 
So we have calcium here. We have sodium here. Okay. Let me clean the wire loops again. Make sure that they are clean. Okay. Let me touch both chemicals. Okay. My right hand, here you can see the calcium here. And this one is sodium. The calcium, you can see the color and see the color of the sodium. They are almost close to each other. But of course you can see the orange color for the calcium is a little bit more. We can write dark orange. And also we can approximate the wavelength of the calcium and which will be somewhere around 500 nanometer. Of course you can check with the spectrum. Let me move on to the next chemical. Let me move on to the next chemical which is barium. I'm going to use a new chemical, new wire loop for that. Let me clean the wire loop. Let me go to the cleaning procedure, make sure the wire loop is well cleaned. Okay, it's almost clean. Now, let me touch my barium chemical. And bring it close to the fire and try to observe the immediate color it's producing. You can see it's producing a light yellow color. Some of us maybe we we may be able to observe a little bit of a greenish. A light yellow color close to the green side, little bit. Okay. Let me do it one more time. Yeah. So we say that green is yellow for the barium and if I approximate this wavelength for barium which is almost close to 550 nanometer. Okay, let me proceed with my next chemical. My next chemical is strontium. Of course the strontium is going to produce a unique color. Okay, let me start using a clean wire loop for that. Let me do the cleaning procedure. Okay, almost clean. Okay, let me take the strontium. Okay, let me dip my wire loop into the strontium sample. And see that? Let me bring it to the flame. You can observe a unique red color. You can see it's very clear and it's easy to identify strontium sometimes they call it brick red they call it brick red and unique color of course okay if you approximate the wavelength so you can record the color of this flame you can record the color of this flame and also you can approximate uh, the estimate the wavelength of the strontium in your standard table and the strontium is somewhere around 700 nanometer <coughs> the wavelength will be right let me go to the my next chemical which is copper 2 plus iron I'm using I'm using a wire loop new one and let me clean it I'm cleaning it with acid then I clean it with the water and check it you can see some color still remaining so you have to continue cleaning it Okay, almost clean. Okay. Let me immerse the chemical into the chemical. This is copper 2 plus iron I have. Okay, when I bring the copper 2 plus iron, you can see the sample is blue. But the flame color, no need to be blue. It, it will be different hopefully, inshallah. Okay, have a look at it. You can observe some greenish color. Yeah, it's producing a green flame. Of course, you observe some yellow. Maybe it's due to some impurity. The color of the copper 2 plus is green flame. So you can approximate the wavelength of this green color in the spectrum and which will be hopefully around, we can see in the range of around 520 somewhere. Okay, we got our last chemical now. We got our last chemical. The last chemical given to us is Fe2 plus iron. 
Fe2 plus ion, it is FeSO4. The Fe2 plus ion is well known that it is difficult to observe the color at the flame. But let, let us make sure, okay, let us use the clean, uh, uh, clean the wire loop first. Okay, let me clean it again. Okay, almost clean. Now, let me touch the Fe2 plus sample. And I have a little bit of Fe2 plus sample here. Maybe very little. I can bring it to the flame. You can see that it's very difficult to observe the color of the flame for Fe2 plus. Uh, possibly, it may need very high temperature to excite the electron. You can see, yeah, it's producing a very light yellow color. Can you see? Okay. Anyway, if you can, try to record this color also and, it's, and then uh, estimate its wavelength. Let me try once last. Okay. See, it's difficult to observe the color. Maybe it might give a light yellow color. Anyway, that's all about for standard sample. It means I have done the experiment for known metal ions. Uh, completed the demonstration part of the flame test. Now it is coming to the real test of the uh, identification of unknown sample A, B, C, D uh, based on your experience from the demonstration part. So uh, you are really supposed to do this experiment and record and identify the element but I am going to perform it and you will record and you will identify the elements. Now. This is the table we have completed, the demonstration part. Now we are moving on to the second table, the sample A, B, C, D. And we have to fill all this and in order to the identify our unknown sample uh, and it's uh, comparing with the previous table. Okay, let me start now. Okay, I am starting with unknown sample A, unknown sample A. So it's same procedure, take the wire loop and clean it test it with the flame of course it's not clean again cleaning what the cleaning procedure okay it's almost clean now dip your wire loop into sample a and bring it to the flame you can observe the color Now I am going to perform the flame test on the sample B in a similar manner. Take a new wire loop, clean it, go to the cleaning procedure, okay, fine. Let me dip the wire loop into sample B and bring it close to the flame. You can observe the color, please, you have to record this color and also you have to approximate the wavelength. Let me do it one more time. Observe the color and estimate the wavelength from the spectrum and then go for conclusion to identify this unknown element B. Then I am moving on to unknown sample C. So let me clean the wire loop. I will dip the clean wire loop into sample C and bring it close to the fire and you can observe this color and record this color 
and also estimate the wavelength from the spectrum and then go for conclusion column and try to identify this element comparing to, to our demonstration. Then we go to the last. My last chemical is D. So let me use a clean wire loop for that. I want to clean it. Okay. Just dip the wire loop into sample D and bring it close to the fire flame and record this color. Of course, you can see the color. Record the color of this flame and also estimate the wavelength using the spectrum and go to the last column and identify this element comparing with the demonstration table. That's all about the flame test. You will be able to identify all these unknown elements A, B, C, D approximately.